Loss in Addiction and Recovery will be presented by Jerry Fouchet and Barb Smith. Jerry has extensive experience in the field of education as an administrator, facilitator, strategist, teacher, and practitioner in the areas of educational administration, curriculum, instruction, and staff development. And he has played in leadership roles in many initiatives in various public school districts. After several years as a John Farm Sparrow Recovery Center counselor, Jerry currently serves as personal medicine and outpatient therapist for John Farm. He played a major role in the implementation of John Farm's dialectical behavioral therapy and personal medicine programs. Barb Smith is the author of French World, a book about the life and death of her oldest son. Barb is a frequent speaker at community, school, and church functions. Barb will share her personal story of grief, loss, and recovery. Please join me in welcoming Jerry and Barb. Thank you, Emily, and welcome. Yes, Mike. So great for folks to talk about it. It's an important topic. You know. If I can echo what Emily had to say is, you know, sometimes when we wade into this thing about grief, we, we touch on some things. Sometimes we, we, we wake up thoughts from the past, particularly for people in recovery. Many of us have what I would call delayed grief. While we were out there drinking and drugging, we put all that stuff off and kind of put it on the shelf. Uh, I remember very clearly uh, having been sober about a year and a half myself and was in church one day and the music they played was the same music they would played at my grandmother's funeral many years earlier and I broke into tears that the grief finally came out. So if it touches you in some specific way tonight, you know, and, and you, you feel the need to talk, you know, as I said, there are many staff members around happy to chit chat with folks, connect you with resources as appropriate. There's also a couple of support groups out there that are mentioned in the handout and whatnot that uh, we'd encourage you to become involved with. It's an important piece. I think what is so key in our understanding of, of grief is that grief is a universal experience and grief happens. Um, the person who, who used to do this presentation for us, uh, Janice, she talked about how, she says, you know, when you want to talk about grief, you want to think about it like it's that song they used to teach kids at summer camp. You know, it's, it's so wide you can't get around it, it's so high you can't get over it, it's so low you can't get under it, you just have to go through it. You don't have to go through it all at one time, you don't have to do it all, at one, all, all, all immediately, right now. But the bottom line is you have to go through it. Unresolved grief just sort of puts our lives on hold in many, many ways. There are some key questions we're going to want to ask and discuss in the course of our time together tonight. You know, so why do we bother to talk about grief? Why, why do we experience it? There's some theories out there, some, some research has been done to try to help us understand that. We're going to sort of pick and choose pieces and parts of that that may be useful to us tonight. How is grief related to addiction? And this is kind of a key piece for us as an agency, as Dawn Farm as an agency, and probably for many of our, our uh, guests this evening. How is grief experienced in recovery? And uh, last but not least, is what, what is it that helps or starts to make a difference with grief? Um, there are a couple of key concepts, though, I want to lay out right from the start. Um, and there are things like, number one, grief is real and cannot be ignored. As I mentioned, it's so high, you really can't get over it. Um, the expressions of grief are many and varied. Uh, we don't want to get the notion that there's only one right way to grieve. Um, we're going to see it happen in a variety of ways from person to person and role to role. We cry, we get angry, we be depressed. Uh, we get withdrawn, we act out, we laugh, or we brood emotional. It can go all over the place at any given point in time. And understanding that all of those are perfectly normal and appropriate uh, is, is important. Number three, the stages of the grief are generally not linear. If you go back to some of the earliest work on, on the study of grief, uh, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talks about the five stages, one, two, three, four, five, and everybody <laughs> assumed that it was a linear process, that you'd start at stage one, finish that, and go through stage two. What we know is, is that some of the more modern frameworks talk about it as the various tasks of grieving, and that we don't necessarily do them in order. And Maybe we're not done with this one, we'll be starting into that one. Maybe we've got two of them going on at the same time. So we want to talk about that, that notion of, of grief as, as, a, uh, as an organic process that involves several things over time. Number four is working through the emotions requires a willingness to acknowledge the loss or change. One of the key pieces has to do with the beginning of the acceptance of the fact that there has in fact been a loss. 
we tend to focus on the loss of a loved one as being the most key one, the largest one, that which is large. But there are many, many, many losses that we experience in a variety of ways, and we'll, we'll start to bring some of those forward today. Because sometimes folks are not in touch with, like, what is the source of their grief? They're experiencing grief. They're experiencing uh, depression. They're experiencing that, that range of experiences around grief and, and are not acknowledging that which, which has drawn them to that. It takes time to get through it. Uh, grief doesn't happen fast. Uh, people talk about, well, it takes you at least a year. You know, you got to get through all the birthdays and anniversaries and holidays, and, that sort of, and then you'll be done with it. You know, and and I, I and I think our, our long run experience is grief just lasts. The question is, are you processing it? Are you doing something with it, or are you just stuck in one place with it? Uh, and last but not least, active alcoholism and addiction significantly complicate the processing of grief. If we are still actively using, our ability to emotionally process anything is dramatically reduced. Uh, we've talked about how uh, people with alcoholism and addiction, you know, once they start into their regular pattern of use, their emotional development tends to be arrested, as does all of the major events that, that need to be processed over time. If we start out with why talking about grief, I mean, grief has to do with a loss. And all changes generally refer to some kind of loss. I mean, uh, Janice Fern, who did the, this presentation a while back, she talked about, you know, she got married at 35 years old to a wonderful person to whom she is madly in love. And yet she realized that she was giving up her role as a single person. And there were certain things she enjoyed about being a single person. You know, you know just don't have to fuss at anybody about the toothpaste tube or whatever it is, you know. You can kind of create your own life and do things the way you want them to do. And if you're going to be involved, it doesn't mean... She, it was a big source of grief, it was a big loss, but it was in fact a loss. It was a place there, and so whenever any change happens, there's a potential loss. Uh, we talk about the variety of little deaths that, that we might experience, but change is inevitable. You know, growth, growth can be optional. We need to integrate and express our emotions around grief. If not, we sometimes get stuck, and active addiction or alcoholism increases the likelihood of getting stuck. Um, Stanley Kelman, you know, he talks about working through our endings allows us to redef re redefine our relationships, to surrender what is dead or lost, and to accept what is alive, and to be in the world more fully and to face the new situation more clearly. The, the next slide really talks about a key tool in understanding this whole notion of grief or loss, and it has to do with the notion of attachments. We grieve the loss of something because we've been attached to it. But there are different kinds of attachments, and it's kind of important to, to delineate those. First of all, we can talk about like the secure attachments. I'm securely attached to friends and relatives and buddies of mine. I'm securely attached to my car, because my car always starts when I go out there and put it, the key in it. And I'm securely attached to my job, because there's no threat to that right now. But we get attached to things because they're consistent, they respond to us, they work in our lives for us, and, and they're meaningful. And to everything to which I'm attached, at some point I made the decision, conscious or unconscious, to get attached. So we talk about secure attachments, and these are the ones which, when broken, can precipitate the most grief. The second type of attachment, which a lot of folks find a little challenging, is the notion of an avoidant attachment. This is an attachment to something where it, you really don't necessarily want to be attached, but by way of history, by way of circumstance, you are attached. This could be attachment to an abusive parent or spouse. This could be um, an, an attachment to anything or, or situation which is unhealthy, but yet at the same time provides s some, some sense of meaning that, that, that forced, that, that, not forced, that, that encouraged me to pursue the attachment. And uh, then the third type is the anxious attachment. Now this is the attachment where it's like, I'm attached, and I've got some rules and expectations for this thing or this person to whom I am attached, but they inconsistently respond. Perhaps they're not attached back. Perhaps uh, they're inconsistent. Now, what, is, what I'm warming up for here is, is one of the most significant attachments that I want to talk about tonight. And that is the attachment between the alcoholic and the addict and their drug of choice. Let me help you with this. Early in the experience of addiction, I have a secure attachment to my drug of choice. I know that once I get three drinks in, I'm going to get to a certain place and things are going to be good. Okay? Over time, 
as my tolerance increases, as my disease progresses, I'm going to require more of the drug in order to get where I think I need to get, in order to get there. And yet, it becomes less dependable. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it creates problems. All right? And then eventually it gets to the place of an avoidant attachment. I don't really want to be there, but I can't imagine living life either with it or without it. Okay? So you want to understand the importance of that attachment to the alcoholic and the addict. Because when we ask them to get sober, we're asking them to give up the most, in many ways, the most significant attachment of their life. And I, and I, I want us to see that with, with some clarity. So I want you to think about that notion of attachment and the different types. But persons, I mean, we've got many, many different things in terms of our, 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 our character, our personality, our past, our, our roles in life. Many, many different areas in which we could experience loss. Uh, for instance, um, talk about the roles that I have as a, as a parent, as an employee, as a brother. Um, when my sister passed four years ago, you know, that, that role was diminished. Was, and, I, and I not only grieved the loss to my sister, but that role, that, that interaction that we had, that, that, that wonderful stuff we had going on was no longer going to happen. Uh, we talk about our, uh, having bodies as we age, or if we have an accident or a handicap, and our body becomes less functional, that is a significant loss. So you can kind of see all these areas um, provide an opportunity for loss and consequently the need for grief. Um, we talk about a transcendent dimension or a spiritual life. Uh, if we get to the point of having some crisis of faith, I, again, it can be very, very challenging because some folks sort of, when they go through a major change, you know, and they've depended in this, in this, this spiritual path for a long time, and then they find it not working for them because it needs to change, it needs to evolve. And it can be experienced as a tremendous loss. We talk specifically, this kind of lists out a lot of the things I've already alluded to but the types of losses that, that people will experience. But near the bottom of the list are the, are the two that stand out for us the most, and that's for the alcoholic the addict is the loss of their drug of choice, and for most of the rest of the world, the loss of anyone's life. That's the more specific one that we tend to relate to on a regular basis. Um, our losses are many because our attachments are many. You know, the many facets of a person's character, the roles, are all places where change and consequently loss can take place. And loss is eventually going to equal grief. So as you start to outline the, the, the broad domain of what, could it, what loss could involve, I also want you to think about the uniqueness of the response to loss and grief, because there might be some broad similarities. But to a larger degree, two folks coming from the same position may be grieving in very different ways, and their responses may be very different. I mean, being a whole person, we express our griefs in a variety of ways. Um, you know, the same loss often renders a very different expression from different people based on the role. If a woman dies, she perhaps is a wife and a mother, a sister, a daughter, a friend, a co-worker, and all of those people are going to have very different responses to the loss. Um, the other thing is when we start to talk about the frequency of exposure to loss, you start to realize that sometimes folks have one loss after another and they stack up and the processing problem becomes much more significant because you've got multiple losses to deal with. Uh, occasionally you will encounter individuals who just had a really bad run of things. You know, it's like they were sick and they lost their job and they got in a car accident and you go, I don't know, what else can possibly happen? I remember uh, many, many years ago sponsoring a man who got sober, which seemed like a wonderful notion. And then his wife left him, and he lost his job, and his back went out on him, and it was like one thing kept piling up one right after the other. And it was everything he could do to just get up in the morning and process enough to get to a meeting, to try to start to think about looking for work, to get to the grocery. When these things stack up, it, it, can, be, it can be very uh, stifling in a lot of ways. If you look at the, about the second half of your package, you have this thing called the student stress scale. And what you will see is that it, it, on the two pages, it provides a list of 31 different uh, challenges, uh, changes that might happen in your life. And it invites you to sort of think about how many of those have happened in the course of time, add up the numbers. You know, any of the numbers by themselves are not such a big deal, but you start stacking three and four of them together, it starts to turn into a big deal. 
And so I invite you to, to think about that, to sort of use that as a way to scale, like what level of stress, what level of loss are you struggling with at any given point in time? And of course, you know, the need for social support during grief is, is really, really important. You start to talk about typical responses to grief. You know, we can respond in, in, uh, from a variety of perspectives. I mean, from an emotional perspective, it's very common for people to be sad, angry, in shock, relief, not even being sure how they feel. From a physical perspective, people fe report feeling hot, cold, hungry, tired, tense, having no appetite. From the mental or cognitive point of view, they talk about having a longing or a yearning, consumed by thoughts of death or loss, or thinking that the person may is still present. I remember very vividly, several years ago, my wife's uncle died. And, uh, pardon me, my wife's aunt died. And um, her husband, my wife's uncle, you know, had made all the arrangements to have the body picked up and go to this funeral parlor and to make arrangements and get all the things kind of worked out together and get it sorted out and stuff like that. And he got in his car and he drove home, parked the car, got in the house and went looking around the house for his wife to report what he'd done because he always, when he got home, checked in with her about what he'd done. And it's that, that momentary lapse of reality is not unusual. It's like I'm so used to the person being part of my present that the loss is not real yet. It hasn't actually happened. I mean, I can, I can cognitively tell you that, yes, I, she was dead. Yes, we made arrangements. Yes, you know, I purchased a casket. Yes. But I still need And that loss of that, that regular person to communicate with, that loss to regularly bounce your ideas off, was gone. And that, that was when it really started to become real, really, very, really, really, really very strongly. Um, when we start talking about um, socially or behaviorally, people cry, they sleep, they want to be alone, they need time, they, want to, they don't ever want to be alone. It, it, can, it can travel through those varieties of places. We talk about from a spiritual dimension, and whether that's religious or, or generically spiritual, um, People want to try to find meaning. They start asking questions. They go like, well, where is God in all this? And they, they try to seek support in their religious faith. They're trying to understand. You know, family members will often be in very different places with different emotions at the same time. And again, a lot of that has to do with the different roles that they're things. So we want to be, we want to be mindful of that. Another distinction that I want to sort of draw for us is the difference between grief and depression. And they can be co-occurring, but they're not the same thing. You say, oh, I'm really depressed, you know, I, I lost my job and I'm just really, really odd. Okay, well, you're grieving, okay, but I'm not sure you're depressed. You may be depressed also. But let's start to define the difference between the two. Some of the authors talk about grief feeling like a roller coaster. It's an up and down experience. You're in and out of it. It's, it's sort of all over the place. The classic example of this was talk about a group of family members being gathered around the deathbed of a relative. And they said, oh, you know, remember four years ago on Thanksgiving, Grandma burned the carrots, smoked up the whole house, and everybody's giggling and laughing, you know. And then two or three minutes later, everybody's crying again. It's that, 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 motion, that notion of as you grieve, you move in and out of, of the positive memories as well as the negative ones and the losses. And it's not unusual that there's, you know, some people, oh, you, oh, you should be more dignified. You know, no, no, I should be what I am. That's what I should be. Um, you know, so we talk about this roller coaster being up and down and all over the place. Depression, on the other hand, could feel like a dead end. You know, we talk about it as... Uh, no specific, no future, no emotion, sometimes a self-loathing. Sometimes it's necessary to get some professional help there. Now, I talk about them co-occurring occasionally to often with serious grief. And to be able to sort out the differences is, is, is the place you want to go. But the way you sort out grief is you've got to talk about it. You've got to talk about who you're talking, who can you talk to. If you're in recovery, I hope you're talking to your sponsors and your sober supports and your family, and your buds, and whoever else, and your co-workers, whatever, whatever context seems appropriate to process that grief. But as you're talking to people and processing it, I mean, maybe some folks at some point say, you know, Jerry, you've been in the same place now for two months on this. We've had this conversation on Monday morning. Every Monday morning you come back, and you, you're still down, and you're still not feeling, you're stuck. Okay, so now we're not talking about just grief now, we're talking about depression as well. So what are you going to do about that? Who can, you, can we talk to somebody in employee assistance? What can we do? You know, you're going to need to get that. But that's why it's important to talk about it, because you need some feedback from people if it's not working for you. Um, 
Uh, next is I want to talk about the myths about, about grief and about loss. Uh, there are those who will tell you that the pain of the loss will go away faster if you ignore it. And uh, that's, that's just simply not true because if I go back to the camp song, it's so high you can't get over it, so wide you can't get around it. You've got to go through it. It's, it's the only thing that's going to work in the long run. It's important to be strong in the face of loss. No, it's important to be real. We need to talk about what's going on for us. We need to talk about the, the, the feeling of it's just so much effort to breathe. It's just so much effort to, to try to, to, to think about getting dressed. I think, I think I'll have another cup of coffee and just sit, you know. Um, it, can, it can be like that. Um, we want to work through them. We also need to teach, teach kids how to grieve at levels that are, that are developmentally appropriate. Um, I remember very distinctly when I was about five or six years old, uh, I had a shoestring granduncle that died, somebody I probably had never actually met. And my mother insisted that all the kids go to the funeral. And her motivation there was she was 16 years old before she'd ever gone to a funeral herself, and she found the sight of a dead body very distressing. She didn't want us to do that. So she sort of enculturated us to the notion of this is what happens. And yeah, people are crying and ask questions. Let's talk about it. You know what I mean? It was a very sort of healthy, um, healthy response to the situation. Obviously, if, if you're very overcome by grief and you're working with a two-year-old, you probably want to tamp down your grief a little bit. You know, otherwise, you're going to might overwhelm them. And yet, at the same time, like to whatever degree you can appropriately help, help kids begin to understand this notion. Um, the uh, French philosopher Rousseau, in his treatise on a meal, talked about, he says, you know, if we shield children from pain, we don't teach them to bear it, we train them to feel it. And I think that was really key because that's in fact what I had my mother. She inadvertently had been trained to feel the pain of loss much more than, than she should have had. She had some education or culturalization to that earlier. Um, the third one is if you don't cry, it means you're not really sorry about the loss. Now, you know, crying is great, but, but I've heard people say, I'm just too tired to cry. I don't have any more tears left. Uh, and crying, however good, is not necessarily the only or the best way. It is a way. You want to think about that variety, that everybody's response is not going to be the same or consistent. And last but not least, when it talks about grief lasting about a year, I love Janice's uh, example. And she talks about grief just lasts and lasts and lasts. The question is, at what stage are you in the processing of the grief? She says, if you were to think about your life like it's a, it's a, it's a great woven tapestry, Way up here at the top is when you were born, you know, and there's a variety of colors and there's a variety of, sh of, of shapes and, and, and textures in the fabrics as they're coming out as your life is bright times and lots of bright times and ordinary times. And when you have a great loss, whether it's through a death or a loss of a job or a loss of expectations or whatever it is, when you have a great loss, it's almost like you're weaving in a great big purple band. And it's very noticeable and it stands out and it just, it just it's right in front of you, and it's big and in your face. And you, you, but you continue to live your life, and you keep weaving the tapestry. And as time goes on, there's more stuff there. It's not as big a percentage of your life anymore. And, and as you process the grief, you get to the point of getting, saying, yeah, that's there, and that was a big piece, and that really slowed me down a lot. But it's not stopping me today. I didn't get stuck. I didn't stay there forever. And I love that, that image of, of building the tapestry over time. So the whole notion of it lasting about a year, I, I don't think it's worthwhile. I, I don't, you probably had the experience of talking to folks, and they'll, they'll reflect on a lost relative, somebody who died 30 years ago, and they smile when they tell the stories. They're smiling because they're still attached, positively so. And even though the loss, the loss has been processed, the purple band's way up there now. I'm down here in this life now. I formed new attachments. See, and that's the first indicator that we've started to really get over to grief is that we've started to form new attachments. And we start talking about people who enter into recovery and they, you know, they start to really get in touch with how much they've lost when they, when they get there in terms of, of things. You know, and they, um, it's like they, they know what they're supposed to stop doing, but they haven't figured out what they're supposed to start doing yet. And it's like, what are you going to start attaching to? And the people who attach to recovery, you know, it's like any, any of my former clients in the room or current clients, some of them, 
It's, it's like they know. It's like we're always beating your tail about, have you got a sponsor yet? Have you talked to your sports? Get some dry downs. Get the, Why do I have to do all this stuff? I can ride the bus to the meeting. No, you need to. Why? Because we want you attached. Because when you form new attachments, the likelihood that you're going to get lost in your loss, lost in your grief, is dramatically reduced. Understand? We're not just trying to be a pain in the ass, which I am sometimes. <laughs> which I am sometimes. I can, all, all clients will attest to that. Let's try to talk about theories of grief. I mentioned Elizabeth Kubler-Ross before. She talks about these five stages, you know, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and eventually acceptance. And let me sort of break that down to a much simpler example. <clears throat> Let's say, for instance, that I've lost my car keys. I'm very frantically running around the house trying to find my car keys because I'm going to be late for a very important event. Okay? I'm sorry, what? Somebody's lost their car keys recently, I can tell. Okay. And, um, and the thing is, I've run all over the house, and I've, I've checked my pockets of all my coats. I've checked in. I've gone. I've looked in the car. I've up and down the driveway. I've gone every. I just drove the car home last night. They've got to be here someplace. And I go back and look at the same places four more times. They're not there. I don't know where they are, but I know where they're not. But my denial is very clear that I'm pretending like they're not really lost. They're going to be in that place. I've already looked three times. Okay. And then I get angry, like, why is this happening? Don't they know how hard I work? And I got up today, and I was ready for this. And, and we start, oh, what should it, it just shouldn't be like this. They shouldn't make them that hard to find. You know, by the way, they do have gizmos you can put in your key ring, where you can dial your phone, it'll help you. Anyway, for those of you that are concerned. Then you get to the bargaining place. Well, if I put a nail in the wall right next to the door jam and hang my keys on it every time I get home, they will always be there. I will never have to put up with this again. Okay, and oh, I'm so sad that I missed this important date today, that or not, you know, but what am I supposed to do? Then eventually you get to the place of acceptance, and I say, well, I mean, that's, that's the way it is. I guess I just need to proceed. But when you start to think about those things in, in the context of a much larger loss, you know, my wife's uncle, he wasn't planning denial, but in his shock and his disbelief, he didn't remember that he just made arrangements for her funeral and she wasn't at home to talk to him, okay? Okay, my suspicion is, although I wasn't there for that, but that, that his anger bubbled up shortly thereafter. Okay, because it wasn't supposed to happen. She was supposed to be his partner for life. That's all those kinds of things, you know. Then you start to think about, well, this is this is really crap. You know, how do I avoid ever getting? And you don't necessarily this is on a conscious level, but I don't. How do I ever get avoid? Well, I'm just not ever going to get that close to anybody again. Notice how the resistance to forming new attachments it will protect me. But I'm so sad, and this is so hard. And eventually you get to the place of, no, things are gone, things are different. I need, I need to figure out how to do things differently. So that's Kubler-Ross, and her stuff is close to 60 years old now, and it still has some validity. But there are other people that have written some more recent things which are, which are kind of interesting. Um, Stroby and Shutt talk about this movement back and forth between, um, well, I like to simplify his diagram, basically by saying he talks about the, the difference between people who process loss and grief emotionally versus those who process it instrumentally. So what he's saying is some people, are, they got to talk about emotions, they got to do the crying, they got to do all of that stuff right now, and nothing else takes precedence over that. And then you have the folks that are instrumental. Somebody's passed. I got to make arrangements. I got to order flowers. I got to get a luncheon together for all the people coming into town. Who's making the plane reservations? Boom, 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 boom. Now, I've described two ends of the continuum. People are going to be lots of places in between also. But understand that these people and these people, if they're in the same household, they're going to be like this. Yeah. Don't you care? Why aren't you grieving? I am grieving. Can't you see how hard I'm working? Okay. And over time, these people come closer and closer together in their expression of the grief. So that was, that was you know, uh, Stroby and, and, and Schutz's contribution to talk about that, that uh, significant difference in the way people process. Uh, Martin and Doka really fo focused, it's similar to Strobe's model, but they focused on um, people, basically the differences in personality and culture and that sort of thing uh, around <coughs> grief. And he talks about the intuitive versus instrumental and, and that sort of thing, but there are a lot of similarities between Strobe and Shutt and, and Martin and DeLuca. But the one I want to talk about most specifically is uh, Warden's and he talks about the four tasks of mourning. So he eliminates the notion of stages like it's sequential or happening in order. And he says that it has four big things we really need to go through. 
Now, the exceptions will look familiar to you, because we know Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talked about that as an eventual thing. But you've got to accept the reality of the loss. The second thing is to experience and work through the pain of the grief. Three is to adjust to the new normal, or life without whatever it was that was lost. And to four is to emotionally relocate uh, the loss and move forward in life. Now, the stages are not prescriptive. They're not necessarily going to happen in order. They're not discrete tasks. They don't happen one and then the other. And more than one of them can be happening at the same time. So let's tear apart their, their uh, Warden's model and, and learn a little bit more about it. Talk about the first thing in terms of accepting reality. Come full face with the fact that your loss is real and will not return. It is not returnable. I'm not going to make it to work on time today. The keys are gone. So-and-so is, is past now, and it's not going to happen. Uh, the immediate reunion is, is of regaining it is impossible. Now, what is very interesting about this particular feature of Warden's model is when you start talking about things like romantic relationships, the relationship is broken. There is a real loss. But if one of the partners is sort of holding out for, well, maybe he'll change his mind. Maybe he'll call me again. Maybe we'll get back together. The loss is never properly grieved initially. You keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. And if you get people who talk about being stuck in an old relationship, is, is that they've not accepted the fact that it's over and done. You know? and, and obviously, people go through various stages in that process. But if it is over and done in one person's mind, it may take a while for the second person to get to that place. But denying the facts, denying the media, oh, it wasn't a good job anyway, I don't miss him, I'm just as healthy as I ever was. I mean, oh, it's no big deal. That's, that's part of the ways we might prevent the acceptance. The second one in terms of experiencing and working through the pain, it's impossible to lose something or someone that you have been deeply attached to without experiencing some level of pain. So it's like, we've got to talk about the pain. You can't run from it. You know, I talked about the pain I experienced at my grandmother's funeral, the loss, pardon me, at, at the music from my grandmother's funeral some years later, okay, because the pain had been pushed off and set to the side. Um, but if you don't allow yourself to feel, and sometimes that's frightening. Oh, God, this, this is like such a big piece. If I let myself feel it, will I ever come back? And the answer is yes, you will. You don't want to do it alone. You don't want to do it all at once. But you want to do it. You want to get into it. Some people find journaling very helpful because it starts to formulate the questions for them. When I take the time to get the thoughts written on the page, I've slowed the thoughts down enough so that the pen slows me down to the point where, oh, that's the question I really need to deal with. Oh, that's what's really bothering me. Like, we don't always get that because we're thinking so fast sometimes. Take the time to journal. I really encourage folks to do that as a vehicle to get in touch with that. Third is to look for the new normal. Coming to terms with being without, maybe raising children alone, facing future unemployment or handicap, redefinition. But what's the new normal now? Um, if you've uh, ever talked to a parent who has a handicapped child, when they realized at some point that the child was handicapped. The amount of, of adjustment is dramatic because they have all of these expectations for the future that are usually going to be different now, dramatically different. And that's not, that's not the task that a lot of people signed up for. And yet it's the real task that's in front of them. Um, they talk about external, internal, and spiritual adjustments. In other words, how do you get to the normal. Have you, have you, how does the loss affect your everyday functioning in the world? I mean, if it's somebody that you lived with, it changes tons of things in your everyday world. Um, internal adjustments, how does that affect your sense of self? You know, do you no longer see yourself as, as, a, as a married partner? Do you no longer see yourself as a, uh, as a parent? Uh, how does the, the loss affect your beliefs, your values, your assumptions about the world? Obviously, you could promote your own help it, helplessness And we could do that by refusing to learn new skills, by refusing to take on new roles. Um, so that would be Warden's third step, or pardon me, third task. And then the fourth task he identifies is emotionally relocating. And that's to find a place for what was lost that will enable us to remain connected with it, but in a way that will not keep us from going on with life. Um, as you start to think about, we continue to weave the tapestry of our lives we're connected to the lost, but we're still engaged in life. We're being vulnerable in a healthy way. We can form new attachments and relationships and skills. 
as I said, the absolute key indicator that I'm, I'm healthfully handling a big loss is that I'm making new attachments. Proceeding forward. Eric Fromm's the guy who wrote the book, The Art of Loving. And it, I don't know if you're familiar with his work. It's probably 50 years old by now. But uh, it was kind of a foundational piece. And he talks about to spare oneself from grief at all costs can only be achieved at the price of total detachment, which includes the ability to experience happiness. Because if you shut yourself off from the grief, you're also setting yourself off from fun. I don't know about you, but I like fun. I like fun. I want as much as I can get going. So we talk about grief and loss in addiction. So while someone is in addiction, I, I want to sort of, we talk about unresolved grief or loss of travel often predate the use of alcohol and drugs. And by saying that, I want to, want to sort of clarify. I don't want to give you the notion that because someone was traumatized uh, through grief or loss or because someone was um, abused or whatever, that that caused their alcoholism. I want to be really clear about that. We have alcoholism or addiction because we have a genetic predisposition and we have the environment which gives it a chance to develop. Trauma, loss, and abuse may put it on fast forward, may accelerate the hell out of it, okay? But the bottom line is it didn't cause it. Because if it did, all I need to do is get some good therapy and I could drink safely. And that's not true. And also I know tons of people in recovery who never had trauma, loss, abuse, and they drank with great abandon. Okay, so I just need to be really clear about the two are related, but one does not cause the other. And that's really important to be in, because some people tell you, well, this is the reason why I drank. So sort that reason out and I can go back again. No, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. But it is not unusual for many people in addiction to have unresolved grief and loss early. Uh, it's compounded in addiction. You know, lots of other losses. Things like innocence, loss of relationship, loss of plans for the future, loss of jobs, loss of school. Uh, if, you, if you talk to anybody early in recovery, they frequently can give you a long list of their losses. And they've lost a lot. Um, if you start to think about, it's complicated by you. You can't work through things when you're drunk or high. You tend to minimize things. You tend to say, well, th th that kind of crap happens to everybody. Everybody loses jobs all day. It's no big deal, you know? And the bottom line is it, it can be. And, and perhaps the, the most difficult one, when we start talking about normalizing things that simply are not normal. We, uh, we had a client a few years back who was describing several sexual encounters. And when she got to talking about them, they weren't sexual encounters at all. They were sexual assaults. And when we start talking about, you know, these are crimes, oh, this stuff just happens. It's not a big deal. We can't normalize that stuff because it's not normal. And, 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 to, and, and, if, and if you try to normalize it, then your willingness to, to, to grieve it, to accept it as a loss of personal safety, as a loss of, 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 of uh, personal identity, I mean, whatever ways it plays out for you, it's really important that we don't minimize or normalize the stuff that is not normal. Um, it's to think about the notion of culture of addiction. Some of our clients have, have been educated in that, that notion is that you sort of have this culture of addiction and culture of recovery. And they have a lot of characteristics around them. Well, there are lots of behaviors in the culture of addiction which in that culture seem normal. And that's why it's so hard to sort of move to the culture of recovery sometimes because, but I've been thinking this way all, being dishonest and shooting a move is the way I operate. Well, in the culture of recovery, if you want to be close to people, you're honest and you treat them right. Well, I don't understand that. And, and, and you want me to rat out these people in treatment because they're doing something shady on the side? I don't want you to rat them out. I want you to keep the rest of the environment safe for those who do want to recover. The tension between what happens in the culture of recovery and the culture of addiction um, can be quite profound. Uh, other characteristics of grief and loss and addiction, um, sometimes we use alcohol and other drugs to cope. The lack of a healthy support system is kind of important. Um, uh, one client was talking about how near the end he was at home drinking alone and occasionally he would go to the front door and open up the shutter and look out and go to the back door and part the curtain and look in the backyard and go back to the refrigerator for another drink. When you have a world like that, you don't have a lot of social support. And, and that's, that's, that's not an unheard of thing. Even when folks traveled in groups and packs, there frequently was no real human interaction. It was just more a lot of uh, um, 
a lot of aberrant behavior, let me put it that way, okay? Um, we talk about medicate or avoid or minimize feelings. A grief doesn't get processed. Things tend to pile up. And, but most, perhaps most important is you, the, the guilt, the shame, the loss of spiritual self, the loss of integrity, uh, the loss of my sense of who I am and how I act. Those are the kind of things that really work on the inside of, a, of an addict or alcoholic's head. I mean, there's experiences and events, relationships with families that are not attended, parenting time. Perhaps you spent some time being incarcerated and didn't get close to your kids very long, or you were separated from your family. You missed some of those ordinary, everyday things that really are important milestones in family lives. Uh, perhaps there were deaths or communal expressions of grief where you didn't show up for the funeral or you showed up high and drunk, and so consequently you weren't really present. Uh, the loss of time, opportunities, perinatal losses. I, I was a little startled as I started to work in this field for how many folks had, had lost pregnancies and how difficult that was. Um, I, think, I think broadly, culturally, we don't tend to talk about that a lot. Um, but it, it's, an, it's an important piece. Um, talk about grieving being necessary. You know, uh, Portia talks about man, when he does not grieve, hardly exists. But let's suppose for a minute that somebody wants to move from active addiction to recovery. You know, what are the kinds of things you're leaving behind? You know, Billy Joel wrote that song where he talks about making love to his tonic and gin. I love that image because he's talking about the, the type of intimate relationship that exists between the alcoholic or addict and their drug of choice. Don't for a minute pretend that it isn't important. Now, all the earth people in the audience tonight, <laughs> earth people are people who are not alcoholics or addicts. All the earth people in the audience tonight, my suspicion is when somebody talks to you about drinking, drugging, all you could think of is bad. No, that's a bad thing. They need to quit doing that stuff. And as soon as they quit it, that's the best thing that ever happened. But you're thinking about it like an earth person. You're not thinking about it like an addict. Because there's a very different dynamic happening there. When we start to think about the types of losses, number one, there's a loss of lots of alcohol and drugs. Whatever it is we did. I love the fact that they put the diagram in a heart box. That just kind of worked for me there. Very poignant. Oh, very poignant, yes. I, I really like that diagram. And uh, then there's, the, there's lots of places and roles and friends and activities and things that we can't go to anymore. <laughs> Um, like, for instance, beer pong. It, it, that's just not going to work for you anymore. Um, some, pe but, but some people, it's just chaos. They thrive on the chaos. You know, it's like there's nothing boring going on here. We got stuff happening. And, you know, or we, or the loss of roles. You know, I was a drug dealer. People respected me. I had people line up and follow my directions. You know what kind of stuff, cooperation I could get from people when I wanted it? You're giving that up. I didn't say it was healthy or nice, but from my ego perspective, it was a pretty big piece. I lose the ability to predict events. You know, so in early recovery, people begin to realize that they have lost a lot. And it's no small part. Many and most of these losses are part of our motive to, to use and to get numb. You know, and, and earth people don't want to hear about that. Okay? You get two weeks sober, so, oh, you're looking wonderful. You've got some sleep, I see, and it's just great. And, you're, and, and at two weeks sober, you're saying, shit. <laughs> I don't know which way to turn. I don't know what to do. I don't have a clue how to handle life. And I'm not feeling good at all. I've been numbing feelings for a long time. I've been making it go away. And now you're standing here barking at me about how good I look? You've got to understand. You're trying to be positive, you're trying to be reinforcing, but you're not understanding what's going on in there. And, and, and beginning to understand will, will, will help you with that. Um, if you're an addict on the road to recovery, you know, you've got to be prepared to experience emotions in a new way, both the good, the bad, and the ugly, and be sure to have a plan in place to fight off the cravings. Now, I don't think so much about fighting off cravings as I think about learning to serve the emotional urges. Because sometimes fighting cravings only feeds them. Um, and, and you want to think about, like, you know, th there is a truism here. And, and I want to put it out there and, and uh, see if you don't agree with it. But no feeling, no emotion, no matter how strong or how intense, will last forever. They will all pass in time. But as an alcoholic or an addict who has reached for my drink or my drug, every time I had an unpleasant feeling, for a long time, this habit 
does not go away quickly. And when the drugs and the alcohol worked, which they did for such a long time, as long as it was a secure relationship, remember it's a secure and attached relationship as opposed to the avoidant one, as long as it worked, I continued to go there, and that fixed the feelings. So I'm starting to have feelings now. I have only one response to that. Okay, what are some new responses? How do we start to talk about it? The responses are grief. How do I start to talk about it? It becomes kind of, a, kind of an important thing. Uh, barriers to grieving. Lack of social support. We talked about very few alcoholics and addicts have that right away. That's part of the reason why we fuss at clients all the time to develop their sober support system. Lack of safety or trust. Lack of a plan for alcohol craving. Uh, feelings unfreeze and can feel overwhelming at times. Uh, they feel unsafe. They feel conflicted. Um, by the way, you know, if you ask a person early in recovery what they're feeling, how are you feeling today? They have one of two answers. I feel good, I feel bad. That's the extent of the emotional vocabulary. Because I haven't felt anything in so long, I don't even have the words for it anymore. And so we, we do all sorts of goofy things to treat. We have these word lists. I don't know if you've ever seen, some of you have seen things like this. I know that. I handed it to you. All right. <laughs> but um, but uh, as we start to talk about scared, well, are you a scared? Or are you afraid, aghast, alarmed, anxious, appalled, apprehensive, odd, confused, daunted, distrustful, dreadful, fearful, frightened, hassled, harassed, horrified, insecure? Those are all, but, but those words are not in the vocabulary of people early in recovery. I mean, we set these on the table. We say, try three new words tonight while we're in group. You know, we do that. Why do we do that? Because it's incredibly exhausting to have feelings that I can't talk about. And the more precise my language gets, the better is my ability to process it, whether it's grief I'm processing or anything that I'm processing. So when you're talking to people early in recovery and they're really rest, help them with the words. Do you feel this? Is this what you're thinking? Is it, is it more like this or like this? Is it a bigger word or a smaller word than that? That you actually have those kinds of conversations. Um, it makes a dramatic difference in folks' abilities to communicate what's going on with them. Um, Seemingly unrelated to feelings can arise. Some are intense, anger, depression, that sort of thing. Um, the barriers to grieving are, are a lack of healthy coping skills. It's complicated by guilt, shame, stigma, or trauma. Uh, the inability or unwillingness to grieve can be a barrier for building relationships. But you want to think of recovery as this process. You see the spiral staircase in the diagram here. I love this, this architectural feature. But grief work, like addiction, is not a linear process. You kind of cycle through it over time. You bump into this, you go to that, and it's going to happen. And in recovery, people acknowledge and understand accept losses as they move through their grief. You know, it's the tasks in recovery, I mean, involve coping, coping with feelings, opening up. And you know, we talked about the word list already, finding the new language. Learning to, to tolerate negative feelings, honestly, sit with it. Just be okay with the fact that you don't feel good right this minute. Accepting social support. Trying to, to give up that doing it alone yourself forever thing. Uh, developing new attachments. Um, it becomes really key that we start developing new attachments. Develop some new rituals. You know, I used to have drinking buddies, now I got coffee buddies, you know? Um, recovery offers the opportunity for people to grieve lost relationships, uh, to, to heal damaged ones. You know, if you can't go back and heal old relationships uh, of people gone, uh, you can write a letter. You can make indirect amends. You can make current relationships better and in a new way. Um, when we talk about making meaning from the past, um, one of the key things you could do is generate a history or narrative of this process and find a place for it in your mind and heart. Share it with others. And we talk about the open talks that AA and NA often, types of meetings that they have. Matter of fact, there's one in this room on Saturday nights at 7.30. Whether you're not like not, you're certainly welcome to be here. Because when you come here, you're going to hear somebody talk about their experience, strength, and hope. They're going to talk to you about the losses they had in their addiction. They're going to talk to you about the losses they had in recovery. And they're going to talk about how they made it work, how they continue to make it work. And that's, that's a, a positive thing, because we talk about people sharing their experience, strength, and hope as the vehicle to to helping new people understand how to recover. Oh, I jumped through this fan. Okay. Recovery also offers the opportunity to reconnect spiritually and to grow spiritually. 
Whether it's in a specific faith or a set of beliefs, finding new meaning and purpose is important. Um, we start to talk about what's going on for the family members. This is a long slide, but fundamentally what it comes down to is um, when you have an addict, active alcoholic or addict in the family, frequently they are not present even when they're in the room. And so it's kind of like that romantic relationship that broke up but you never quite accepted because it's still there but nothing's happening. And it, it, it can be very frustrating. Uh, they, folks aren't fulfilling the, the obligations, the expectations of the, of the relationships. The losses include many. Um, financial security for the family. I don't know if anybody in the room has had this experience, but a number of parents talk about, I have to go refinance the house now because I've got to get my kids some good treatment. And I will well, slow down. I'm not saying we don't want to get your kids some good treatment. But we do want to talk about, are you in a position, do you understand that there's no guarantee with treatment? Doesn't mean we're not going to do the right thing and give your kid great service. But I used to work with a woman who was nearing retirement, and her son got in some legal trouble because of his addiction. And she came into work one day talking about, oh, I, this is before I worked in this field. I was in a different field. And uh, she came in, oh, I've got to refinance the house now because I've got to get him into this wonderful place. It's only going to cost me $50,000, $60,000, whatever it was. You know, I said, slow down a minute, sit down. We need to talk. And I just... Number one, she was near retirement. She wasn't in a financial position to refinance the house. And she needed to know some facts about recovery and about treatment. Um, and it's important that, that people are going to make decisions, but they ought to do, be doing them thoughtfully. Hopes and dreams for the future. You know, what kind of person am I is some of the questions we start to ask ourselves. Uh, what is our social standing? Like, for instance, as family members, have I lied for my spouse or my child? Oh, yes, he's really sick today. He's got the flu again. Um, again? Isn't that the third time this month? Oh, anyway. Um, but what does that start to do for me? Um, other important tangible and intangible things, you know, the whole person experiences the loss. There are complicated losses, uh, and this lists a number of them. Um, we can both love and resent the person at the same time. That's easy. You know, we can, are we honest about our feelings? Do we express them well? As, as people exist in this relationship with people who are either still in active addiction or in early recovery, what the current slide shows is a, is a group of continuums where you're kind of moving around in that continuum from place to place. As you're going from despair when things are terrible to hope when things are looking a little better. And you probably bounce back and forth on that line a lot of times before somebody got seriously clean and sober. And then you, you start to um, talk about, again, the notion of what kind of attachment is it? Is it secure? Is it anxious or is it avoidant? Because the attachment may evolve over time. And if somebody's starting to get into recovery, you may be moving from anxious to secure back to anxious again. It may go back and forth for a while. It's not, it's not simple. Not simple by a long shot. Um, I mean, family members are going to have very different emotional responses to this. And, uh, Grief can be some pretty hard work, but it's, it's probably some of the best work you'll ever do. Obviously, you're looking for a lot of social support. The best therapy for grief is time and community, as our friend Michael Logan would tell us. Uh, the places where you can get support, it's in the communities of AA and NA. It's a safe place to be open about feelings and experiences. For the family members, of course, Al-Anon and Naranon and, and similar support groups are out there. There are also lots of appropriate support groups to help you process grief if that is the pieces you're, one of the pieces you're working on. 12-step uh, work helps people express grief, get perspective. Uh, it provides opportunities to give back to others also in that process. In terms of supporting family members, and there's lots of pieces there, Cheryl Sandberg, uh, who is the uh, chief operating officer for Facebook, wrote a book shortly after her husband died very suddenly and unexpectedly. And she was reflecting on the responses of those around her. And she noticed, she says, you know, everyone's going to die. And it's very likely somebody, will, somebody we love will die before we do. And yet the bereaved are often treated like those for whom something unnatural or disgraceful has happened. People avoid them. They don't invite them out. They fall silent when they enter the room. The grieving are often isolated when they most need to be in community. People seem to worry that they will reopen a wound or something. Yet the grieving person is thinking 
You're not reopening the wound. I mean, it's like it's open and gaping. Please help me with it. So that whole notion of when somebody has had a loss, you don't want to just hang back and say, well, how are they doing today? Engage. Pull them in. Bring them into, bring them into the present tense. Be considerate. Help them out. Obviously, many people go to their house of worship for support. Uh, there are rituals you can perform. Uh, lighting candles, uh, prayer ceremonies of various kinds. I remember I, I had a friend years ago who used to hold a dinner at his house on the anniversary of his father's death each year. And he'd invite all sorts of folks over and they'd tell funny stories about his dad. That was the ritual that they practiced. Talk about uh, various tributes, creating a legacy, scholarships, all sorts of things like that are being done. Um, it, it's interesting, uh, some people really focus on the physical representations. I, uh, when my sister passed four years ago, uh, my brother-in-law made a whole lot of little wooden boxes with stained glass tops. And inside the wooden boxes were miniaturized versions of some of my sister's artwork and her writings. And it's sitting on the bookshelf right about at eye level in the TV room in my home. And so a couple times a day I'm usually walking by that and having fond thoughts of my sister. But that physical representation. Yes, I still miss my sister. I don't cry much anymore. But the bottom line is it's, it's th there's there and I can smile. We can tell the funny stories now. Um, experiential techniques can be fun. Art, writing, music, the coloring books, all that stuff is great. Get in there and do it. Uh, take care of yourself. Get sleep. See a doctor if you need to. Know where your grief triggers. Know them. I mean, they might be anniversaries, natural, national tra tragedies, other people handling a similar experience. Um, it was one example of, it, it, uh, the trigger was quite a surprise for the woman. What happened was her husband had done the taxes every year, and she just never bothered with it. It just wasn't something that was important. Well, he died suddenly and unexpectedly. And suddenly, April 15th came along, and she was in an absolute loss. She had no idea what to do, and the grief became very strong and powerful now. Okay. Well, she had to talk about it. She had to find somebody to help her with her taxes, too. But, but the bottom line is stuff that will surprise you, that jumps out at you. You know, the things that will, that will evoke the feelings, will evoke the thoughts. And that's okay. Talk about those. Process them. Bring them out in the open. Um, yes, we talked about the triggers. Okay, good. When is grief healed? You know, the, the, I think the key piece is to understand, and, and I'm about out of time here, so, so I want to uh, tie this up here. But I think we could say grief is healed when a person can think about what was lost without acute pain. You know, I can think about my sister without acute pain today. Uh, when one can think about what was lost without feeling the manifestations of crying, the tightness in the chest, that sort of stuff. When you can reinvest the emotions in life, make new attachments. Regain an interest in life, feel more hopeful, experience healthy gratification again, and adapt to new roles. And is there a time limit? One year, four seasons, two years? No, no time limit. As I said, you're just attached. The question is, where are you in your state of attachment? Where are you in your processing of the grief? At this point, I want to give it to Barb. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Oh. <laughs> Try to get this comfortable. Thank you, Jerry. That was beautiful. I really, really learned a lot. Um, tonight, I, first I want to thank Jess for inviting me. Jess is awesome. She coordinates these, the education series and she is just fabulous and just, you're just an angel. Thank you, Jess. <laughs> well, I'm just going to jump in and tell my story. I grew up in an alcoholic home. My father was the alcoholic. And he was a violent alcoholic. He drank every single day of my childhood except for two weeks when he was in the hospital with double pneumonia. But when he came home, he resumed. And there was a lot of chaos in the house, a lot of financial insecurity. Um, he never lost his job, but there was never any money because he was drinking it all away. So I got a job very young, started buying my own clothes even paid for my own braces. So I learned very young to take care of myself. And um, I also started using as a teenager. 
and that brought a lot of problems, especially with my mother. She was already dealing with my father, and so she was on my case. So I left home when I was 17 because I just didn't want to hear, hear what she had to say, and I wanted to live my life the way I wanted to live it, and I felt like I was taking care of myself anyways, so I was going to do it on my own. Well, that wasn't a very good choice, but I thought it was at the time. And I, and I worked, and I drank, and life just went on. You know, I never, never came to terms with any, anything that happened in my childhood, never addressed it, never cared to. And then my mother got into Al-Anon. She started going to Al-Anon, which is for the family and friends of alcoholics. And she started going for about two years until she gave my father an ultimatum. She had left, went to a friend's house, and she said that she was not coming back unless he got help. So he called my sister, who's a nurse and who is the fixer of the family, and asked her what he should do. And she said, well, you have two choices. You can go into treatment and you can get help for your alcoholism, or you can just resume and be without your wife. And he made a very good choice. He got into recovery. He went, uh, it was called Here in Oaks at the time, here at St. Joe. He went in for 28 days. And before he passed away, he had 27 years sober. I am so proud of that man. It was not the man that raised me. It's a totally different, totally different man. And what was wonderful is that um, I got to see him interact with my son. And so he, he, he was an amazing grandfather, amazing. And so that was really, really healing to me. He never, never made an amends personally, never said, I'm sorry for your childhood, but he made a living amends. He, got, he helped a lot of people. And at his funeral, um, it was sad because he was gone, but there was probably 20% of the people at the funeral were family members, and 80% were people in the, in the fellowship, people that he had sponsored, people that he had helped. And they came up and talked to me and my family and just said how much he meant to them. And, and one gentleman said that he actually credited my dad for saving his life. And uh, recovery is a beautiful thing. It's amazing. It's like, it's like this rose. When you first start into recovery, it's real tight. The bud is really tight. But then as time goes on and the sun shines and you start feeling better and life gets better, that rose just opens up and it's so fragrant and so beautiful. Uh, recovery is just amazing. Uh, my son, um, he started getting into trouble when he was 13. He was using and he got caught buying some weed from somebody at school. And they just brushed it off. Um, that was the first time I was alerted that, that he was using when he got busted. And I was concerned, but I, I was going through a divorce and trying to you know be a single mom, trying to raise you know, my kids, and I just really didn't have the resources to really help him like I think that I could have had I not been going through that trauma at that time of the divorce. But he, his disease got bad very quickly. He was using drugs, and, um, and it just escalated very, very quickly. And then he got into a lot of trouble with the law. And I was at work one day, and I got this phone call from the Sumter Township Police Department. And I didn't even actually know where the Sumter Township Police Department was, but that's where my son was. And they told me that they had him, he was busted for having a stolen gun that he discharged. So I said, Hmm. And he was supposed to be at school. 
So I went to the police department and I picked him up and I just, I just couldn't believe it. I was like, oh my gosh, I don't know what to do with this kid. I really don't know what to do with this kid. And I thought it would be a horrible, it was a horrible day, it really was. But what, it, what happened was, is now the courts were involved. It wasn't just mom getting on his case, about his using, wanting him to get straight, wanting him to get into recovery. I would take him to see therapists. He wouldn't speak, so the therapist would say, we can't help him. Okay, this isn't, this isn't even worth our time. He won't even speak. Once the courts got involved, then he had a choice. He had to make a choice whether he wanted to get straight or whether he wanted to go to detention. And, the, and it was amazing. The judge actually gave him a choice and said that he could come home and live with me if he went into treatment because the, the judge realized that he had a substance abuse problem. So I had to take a look at my drinking because in order for him to come home, he had to be in a sober home. He could not, if they, and they were gonna make spot checks. And if they found any alcohol or drugs, he was gone. He was gone to a detention facility for at least nine months. And we were living in Belleville at the time, so uh, all his court proceedings and everything was in Detroit. So he would have had to go to Detroit for detention. And he was scared and I was scared. And so I say that I quit drinking for my son, which is true, because I had no intentions of quitting drinking up until that point. But I stay sober for me. And today I celebrate 20 years sobriety. And I, thank you. I am so grateful. I love recovery. I love sobriety. I love the, the family that I have today that I didn't have before. It's a wonderful community, wonderful. And when my son passed, you know, people were there for me, really, really there for me. Now, he, he chose, after he got off probation and turned 18, he chose to go back out and use. He told me that my life, the life that I was living, was boring. Going to work every day, staying sober, you know, out of trouble. He said, it is too boring. He said, I can't live a life like that. He said, I like drinking and I like using, and he was a musician, and he said, my music sounds better. And I've heard of um, people that have told me that are in recovery that are also musicians that they say that they did grapple with that for a while. It was a hard transition to make, to be a musician, a sober musician, but he never gave it a chance. And he was living in Wisconsin, and he and his girlfriend had broken up. She left. She just couldn't take it anymore. And um, so things just went downhill very quickly. There was a suicide attempt. We flew out to Wisconsin, tried to get him to come back to Michigan with us, but he said no. He said, no, no, no. He was homeless. And um, finally we had a, a family meeting. My parents, um, my husband and I, and we decided that we were gonna try to get him to come back to Michigan. He was living in his car. And I just really felt like there was no way that he could pull himself up. I just didn't see him he wasn't working. I didn't see him just walking into a rehab facility and saying, here I am, you know, I need some help. I, I just felt like we needed to intervene. So that's what we did. We asked him to come and live with us. Now I had a lot of, um, I had him sign a contract, said he couldn't use, he had to get a job, had to go to AA meetings, and he did some of those things on the list. And for three months, things were not too bad that it was manageable. And then, which, is, which is, was his MO, he would just, just go off the deep end and just really start drugging. And there was a car accident and 
goodness. And that was, it was horrible. He was life flighted. He was drunk. He was life flighted to St. Joe. Um, the lady that he hit was taken by ambulance. So we're all gathering in the lobby, you know, waiting to see our loved one, the family of the woman that he hit, my family. It was so traumatic. I felt so bad that my son was drunk and had hurt this woman. Even that, even that was not bottom enough for him. It just, it just, he just could not get it together. Just could not. So finally, I sat him down and I said, Brent, I can't watch you kill yourself. I can't watch this anymore. And at the time, my youngest, my son was 13. And so he's watching his brother do this. And I sat at enough meetings to know that a lot of times siblings that are using can influence younger siblings to use, which is something I did not want to happen. So I asked him one more time, and it was a, a, it was a Saturday night, and I just sat him down, and I said, please, will you go into recovery? And anywhere, he, you know, he wanted to live in California. I said, I'll, I'll mortgage my house, I'll fly you to California to rehab, please, anything, please. And he said, no, no, Mom, I'm not. He said, if you take me somewhere, I'm going to walk. And I said, Brent, even if it kills you, and he thought about it for a second, and he said, I am not afraid to die. So I went down to the basement, and I had been doing his laundry. So I packed up his laundry in a laundry basket, and I gave him a little bit of money, and I asked him one more time. I said, please, I'm begging you. Will you go into treatment? And he said, no, no. So I said, OK. And I hugged him and I kissed him, and that was the last time I ever saw him alive. Exactly one week later, he died. And I got a phone call from his, his ex-girlfriend, because he had drove back to Wisconsin. And she called me to tell me that they had found him in a parking lot. Apparently, he wasn't feeling good. And so he went to a clinic, but they weren't open. So he was. He was in the parking lot, and he died, waiting for the clinic to open. And that has been such a pivotal turn in my life. I can't even, um, I, feel, I feel like uh, I was Barb before Brent died, and now I'm Barb after Brent died. My whole life has changed, and not all for the better. Some things for the better, because now it's those little things that really don't matter. The, the things that used to bother me before really don't matter. What really is important to me is my loved ones and my friends and carrying the message of recovery. That's what means something to me. When that new person walks through that door of an AA meeting, I acknowledge them, I look them in the eye, and I say, hi, how you doing? I haven't seen you before, my name is Barb. I want everyone to feel welcome. I don't want anyone ever to think that they don't belong. Um, I chose activism to combat my grief. And what I did was, I joined this group, it was an online group of moms, that had lost um, their children to addiction. And there was one father. And uh, several of those women had wrote books. So I thought, I'm going to do that. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a book. So I did. I wrote this book. It's called Brent's World. And it's my son's story from 
my perspective. And it has opened a lot of doors for me. I've gone into schools, um, church groups. I've gone to the detention facility over here on Hog Bank. I've been able to talk to a lot of young people about drugs, you know, the abuse of drugs and alcohol. Some people think it's glamorous. You know, the music industry makes it look very glamorous. There's another side to it. There's a family that loves the person that's using. And another thing that I've found, too, is that I try not to be so hard on myself because sitting around a lot of meetings, I find that most times it's not the family member that's going to be the one that the person that's usually using is going to listen to. It might be the court system. It might be somebody at a meeting. It might be um, a friend. It just, it, it's like there's this lifeboat that we're in. And when we're in recovery and we're working the, our program, we're in this lifeboat. And we're casting off life jackets. And generally, what I find is somebody that doesn't even know me is going to grab that life jacket. Yeah. It's just going to be a chance encounter, maybe a chance encounter at a meeting or a social function um, for, the, for the recovery community. And we just hit it off. Um, I've had, had a, a dear friend that we've met after she attended this session. And she's just dear to my heart. So even though I've had tragedy and it's been horrific, there's been a lot of really positive things that have come out of this. Now my son is gone. There's nothing I can do about it. He's gone. He's never coming back. But I am still alive. This broken heart still beats. And I am determined to reach as many people as I can because this life of recovery is wonderful if you can just get past the initial stages of it. And I love how Jerry was talking about attaching. And that's what we have to do. We've got to attach ourselves to the fellowship. That's where our hope is, the fellowship. That's where we're going to get well, with the fellowship and with our supports and our sponsor and, and being active. It's an amazing, amazing community. I, I don't have, the support I have within the community, the recovery community, I have nowhere else. It's priceless. And maybe I put in a buck or two in the basket, I get way more. The stuff I get out of being in recovery is huge. I could never pay for it, it's priceless. And uh, I'm, just, I'm just such a grateful, grateful member and I'm thankful for everyone that has stood by me and, and now I'm a part of a group that's called Proud Parents of Loss. Two dear people started this group and it meets the first Thursday of every month right over here in a conference room right around the corner and it is amazing if anyone has knows anyone that's lost a child for any reason it's a it's just amazing amazing that we can come together and we can help each other and that's what we do in this recovery community we come together we help each other we have each other's back so thank you very much Proud Parents of Loss. Proud Parents of Loss. It's the first Thursday of every month. And it's just in the conference room right around the corner from here. Seven o'clock. Thank you. Sure. Thank you.